Rose on the back of us, my mama don't cry for me, wife for me, cry for me, live for me, breathe for me, sing for me, honestly, gotta be active, I gotta be still for me, lie to me, nation, hypocrisy, go, make my spirit is by me, like, yeah, open correctional gates, lie, that's a yeah. open our mind as we cast away on Thank you for joining us at today's presentation. My name is Deborah Hammond, Executive Director of the University Student Union at Cal State Northridge. Life is indeed a paradox. While I am appalled that we have to be here again, talking about police brutality, lives lost, systemic racism, and other forms of oppression, I am thrilled that we get to hear directly from one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, Dr. Melina Abdullah. Before we begin, we want to take some time to thank today's sponsors of the program, the University Student Union, Africana Studies, the Black Student Success Council, the Black Faculty and Staff Association, the Black Leadership Council, the Black Student Union, Wisdom, and the Black Male Scholars Program. Together as a community, we are working collaboratively and collectively to do the work that is before us. Dr. Melina Abdullah, today's presenter, is one of the original members and on the ground organizer for the Black Lives Matter Global Network who will focus on the political history of the movement, the struggle in black freedom and true liberation. Through personal narrative and movement analysis, today's session will present the vision and hope for the movement, as well as the approach and strategies used. It will also provide us with tangible ways to plug into the work of social activism and engagement. Dr. Melina Abdullah is a recognized expert on race, gender, class, and social movements. She is among the original group of organizers that convened to form the Black Lives Matter and continues to serve as the Los Angeles chapter leader. She is a professor and chair of the Pan-African Studies Department at California State University, Los Angeles. Dr. Abdullah earned her PhD from the University of Southern California in political science and her BA from Howard University in African American Studies. Professor Abdullah is a womanist scholar activist. Understanding the role that she plays in the academy is intrinsically linked to broader struggles for the liberation of oppressed people. Dr. Abdullah is also a leader in the fight for ethnic studies in K through 12 and university systems and was part of the historic victory that made ethnic studies a requirement in the Los Angeles Unified School District and is also serving on the task force for the advancement of ethnic studies for the California State University system. Dr. Abdullah is the author of numerous articles and book chapters with subjects ranging from coalition building to womanist mothering. She has contributed to popular media, media outlets, including The Root, Los Angeles Times, Truth Dig, Los Angeles Sentinel, Los Angeles Progressive, and BK Nation. She is also the co-host and co-producer of the weekly radio program, Beautiful Struggle, 
which airs on KPFK, part of the Pacifica Radio Network, and hosts and produce the, the weekly internet radio show, Move the Crowd, which airs on Radio Justice. Dr. Abdullah is a recipient of numerous awards. Most recently, she was awarded the 2018 Community Service Award from the National Council for Black Studies. In 2017, Ung Sun Heroes Award from the Oscar Grant Foundation. 2017, uh, Extraordinary Service Award from the African Heritage Studies Association. And the Justice Work Award from Beyond the Bars. In addition to that, she was awarded the Freedom Fighter Award from the NAACP and the Activist Award presented by the National Association for Ethnic Studies. With you, I present Dr. Melina Abdullah. Sorry, this is how you know that you're old, right? When you forget to hit the unmute button, right? <laughs> and you're talking. So thank you so much for having me. Um, it's uh, a different time and, you know, the energy is definitely different when we're trying to generate energy online. So I hope that you can feel me as well as hear me. Um, I was asked to speak about Black Lives Matter. And so I'm going to kind of give a general presentation um, about who we are and what we're doing and how you can plug in. Um, but I want to frame it first. And I also want to say that I want this to be as much of a conversation as it can be. So I can, I think I can um, watch the chat even as I'm talking. Um, so if you have things you want to lift up, please drop them in the chat and um, I'll try to respond as uh, quickly as I can to those questions. So you don't just have to save your questions for the end. Yes, Tracy, absolutely, AB 1460. I'm trying desperately to get that graphic. Some of you all know, um, before we get started on this conversation around um, Black Lives Matter and the importance of doing the work that we're doing, um, before we get started with that, um, let's see, is that working? I don't know. Okay. Well, I hope you can still see me. Um, my computer moved and I can't see me anymore. Um, so before we get started, Tracy is dropping in the chat the importance of AB 1460. Um, we're hosted by or co-hosted by Africana Studies. Um, good. Thank you. You can still see me. Great. Um, we're co-hosted by Africana Studies. I think it's really, really important that we um, lift up that, um, you know, we are in the midst of struggle. And, you know, the struggle that we're facing is not just a struggle in the streets. The struggle pervades every facet of our society. And when we think about the birth of this movement, it's not coincidental that the original members of Black Lives Matter, about half of us, come from Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA. That when you think about who's moving this work forward, we have people like Brother Justice Andrew Marks from CSUN, CSUN's Africana Studies Department. Um, so it's important that we not just struggle for justice in the name of George Floyd, but we also remember that um, you know the struggle for justice has to be entrenched in the way in which we educate ourselves and each other, right? Um, and so Africana studies and ethnic studies is different in the sense that we were not born of the university. We were born out of struggle. We were born out of the black power struggle and the radical struggle of the 1960s. And so our charge is different, right? Um, our charge is different and our work has an impact that's much more far reaching. And so it's really important that we um, acknowledge that. Um, okay. It's really important that we acknowledge that. And we have been fighting for the last two years to make ethnic studies a requirement in the Cal State system. Um, we're almost there. We've won six out of eight steps through legis the legislative process. 
And we are now looking to persuade our uh, senators to vote yes on AB 1460. Yes on AB 1460. So we have a job for you. We want you, because we are not gathering just to gather and talk about ideas, we want you to call your state senator and tell them to vote yes on AB 1460. And I see um, that my comrade in the struggle, Dr. Teresa Montaño from Chicana Chicano Studies at CSUN is participating. Teresa, if you have that graphic, if you send it to me, I'll put it up on the screen. Um, I, I messaged Stevie, some of the work that's happening um, statewide is really, really important. Um, and it's being driven. Is that Teresa? Yeah, that's Teresa. Um, and so it's being driven out of CSUN, out of campuses like yours. So let's make this win happen in the midst of it, right? We can't just struggle in the name of George Floyd. We have to um, remember that the battlefield is everywhere in the name of uh, Paul Robeson, who said that, right? The battlefield is everywhere. And so we have to struggle on campus. We have to struggle off campus. We have to struggle in community and we have to do that work. Great, there is a list which I am going to copy and share with all participants. I just not let me copy first. Okay, we're gonna do it this way. Sorry for this, y'all. Um, this is how organizers gotta do it sometimes. So let's see if it didn't all copy. Why did it not all copy? Hang on one second. I'm sorry. It won't let me copy it. Um, oh, good. It's sent to my email. Okay, Stevie sent it to my email. So in just a minute, I will send you, uh, I'll put the graphic up on the screen so you can know who to call because we can't just be gathering to talk about ideas. We have to have a charge. We have to do work. And so um, let's make sure we do that. And in just a second, I will open my email and pull it up on the screen. So please bear with me because we're doing more than just meeting and then just talking, right? Um, but I promise I'll give you as much time as you're looking for to talk about Black Lives Matter as well. There we go. Okay, sorry for the silence. This is like not um, the way you're supposed to do things. Wait, okay. All right, so here we go, thank you. Teamwork makes a dream work. So this is what we're doing. We're about to win this. Here is your charge. Here's your homework. We need you to, um, do y'all see it? Yes, I think y'all see it, right? Somebody make a noise if you see it. Raise your hand or put something in the chat if you can see it. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, you all see it. So this is your homework. Screenshot that. We need you to call these senators to make sure that this bill passes. Um, what's happening from your chancellor's office and from your board of trustees is they're trying to water down our work. We are saying no. We want ethnic studies to be a requirement. This is not an additional requirement. You all know at CSUN that it is an overlay. So you can take your government class in Pan-African studies, or now I think your Africana studies. You can take your English requirement in Chicano studies. So this is something to make sure that every student at every CSU is able to take ethnic studies, is exposed to ethnic studies, because we know that this is how we win. Um, this is how we transform the educational process. Ethnic studies is important, and so we need you to make calls today as soon as you get a break. Um, okay, um, are there other, and if you drop stuff in the chat, please keep your messages short because I'm not able to um, read long messages as I'm talking. 
All right, so we're gonna move into Black Lives Matter and talk about um, what Black Lives Matter is, talk about our legacy of work, um, and let's see if I can pull up my slideshow because I need to do that. All right, host, I need you to enable screen sharing again. Did that allow me to, it's not allowing me to screen share. It says host has disabled attendee screen sharing. So if you could just enable me to share this screen, that would be great. Hmm, maybe I'm gonna <coughs> do I you got it? It's up on my screen. Sorry for this, it would be greater if we were together, we'd be able to do it. Okay, maybe I should just start talking. I think, Jessica, are you the screen sharer? Are you the, oh, I'm a host now, great. Okay, so here we go. We are going to, there we go um, so everybody got that it's working now I hope so um, so this is Black Lives Matter is a movement not a moment so I'm just going to give a little bit of history um, as to what Black Lives Matter is and how we were founded um, Black Lives Matter was founded July 13th 2013 which was the day that George Zimmerman was acquitted in the murder of Trayvon Martin. And you all, I think, are old enough to at least remember that far back, that, um, you know, what we experienced was the eruption of Los Angeles, but also the eruption of cities around the globe. And something about Trayvon's murder. Now we need to remember that Trayvon was not the first person to be killed by police. We had been involved in struggles for justice um, for other folks. And in fact, Trayvon wasn't actually killed by an officer. He was killed by um, a white supremacist. George Zimmerman identified it white, as white, even though his mother was Peruvian. Um, he also was a, uh, had aspirations of becoming an officer, but was not actually a cop. And so I think there were a lot of things going on. If you remember what happened, um, we saw Trayvon's face. We were exposed to who he was. Um, the story and the narrative was told that Trayvon was simply walking home from a store to watch a basketball game with his brother and his father and had a bag of Skittles and a can of Arizona iced tea in his hand when George Zimmerman decided that his black body had no place in his community, in George Zimmerman's community. And so he stalked 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. He threatened him, ultimately attacked him, and then finally murdered him. And so for months, remember Trayvon was killed in 2012, for almost a year, or more than a year, um, the world was, um, convinced that justice would be brought, that this case was different, that George Zimmerman would go, to, go uh, to prison for the murder of Trayvon Martin. And we watched and were kind of glued to our televisions. And then July 13th, 2013, which was a Saturday, um, we were thinking that the verdict would come in. And it began to become late here in Los Angeles, which we knew it was nighttime there in Florida where Trayvon was killed and where the 
um, trial was taking place. We were told by commentators that, you know, the verdict probably wouldn't come in today. And so I, like many of us, went about my day, the rest of my evening, cared for my children. I actually went to go look at a used car at CarMax. And as I was there, I got a call from my brother. And my brother asked, where are you at? And I tell him, and he said, well, sit down because you're not going to like it. And my brother's words to me were, he got off and they're giving him his gun back. And I remember this fog just overtake me. I remember feeling like I just needed to move my children out of the space that we were in. And we went home and I did what black mamas have to do, um, cooked, fed my children, put them to bed, found somebody to come sit with them, and then called three other black mothers over to my house. We talked about it, we cried about it, and then we went into the streets. And we went to Lamert Park and we engaged in this intuitive organizing. Um, we engaged in um, work that was hugely important, right? That was about the eruption, the, about that question that Langston Hughes asks at the end of the poem when he says, what happens to a dream deferred? And offers all these options, but the last option is, does it explode? We were a part of this explosion. Um, and for three days, I, along with many of my students, some of who you may know, Fumi Lola Fagamila, um, uh, uh, Charlia Gully, um, Simeon Carson, lots of us were in the streets. Gabriel Regalado, we're all in the streets. On the third day of protest, and I was also there with my children, I had three young children at the time, um, four, ages four, no, they weren't even four, three, six, and nine were their ages. And so we were in, the, I was in the streets with those children, with my children. On the third day of protest, we were called together by one of my dearest sisters on the planet. Her name is Patrice Colors. And um, she said, you know, basically we can't afford to just have moments. And we were gathered together in a black artist community in mid city called St. Elmo Village. And um, we pledged under the moonlight to build a movement, not a moment. And that was the moment that Black Lives Matter was birthed. We didn't know, and I didn't know Alicia Garza and Opal Tometi at the time, who had been in conversation with Patrice about how we can make this a movement, not a moment. What they meant by that is we had been parts of struggles for justice for Oscar Grant and Sean Bell and Amadou Diallo and Margaret Mitchell and Devin Brown and all of these people whose lives had been stolen before Trayvon. But the struggle has to be continuous. And so what we birthed was Black Lives Matter as a global movement. We didn't know what it was at the time. We were just regular folks. So please dispel that um, notion that you have to be some kind of special person to step into a calling to birth a movement. You don't. Uh, Patrice is as regular as they come. My students were mostly um, underclassmen. They're as regular as they come. I'm just a mama and an educator. We're as regular as you come. It's about stepping into what I believe is our sacred duty. So what is Black Lives Matter? And you see it up on your screen. Black Lives Matter is working for a world where Black lives are no longer systematically and intentionally targeted for demise. We affirm our contributions to the society, our humanity, and our resilience in the face of deadly oppression. We've put our sweat equity, our work, and love for Black people into creating a political project, taking the hashtag off of social media and into the streets. The call for Black Lives to Matter is a rallying cry for all Black lives striving for liberation. And I think that it's really important that we take um, two of those points. I don't know why it's not letting me move forward, but let's hope it does in just a second. Um, I think that there's, oh, here it is. 
that there's two of those points that I want to lift up. One, Black Lives Matter is a rallying cry. It is not a plea to white society. It's a rallying cry. It's saying that we need to make Black Lives Matter. We need to step into our sacred duty. And then we need to make demands of the existing system. The second point I want to uplift is all Black Lives Matter. So we are on the eve of Pride weekend. It's really important that when we say all Black Lives Matter, we don't just uplift cis, uh, cisgender Black men, um, cis straight men like George Floyd, but it's also that we, important that we know the name Tony McDade as fully as we know George Floyd's. It's also important that we know Breonna Taylor as well as we know George Floyd. So all Black Lives Matter, regardless of class, regardless of gender, regardless of sexuality, all are a part of this movement, um, regardless of incarceration status. Um, there's a current debate between us and the LA Times. We know that since this district attorney, Jackie Lacey, has been in office, 608 people have been killed by police. The LA Times is trying to say, oh no, it's only 400 right? Not that 400 is a low number. But what they're neglecting is people who are killed in custody. And so people who are killed in jails and prisons like Waukesha Wilson, like John Horton, like your own Quentin Thomas, right? We got to remember Quentin Thomas. Um, they are also included in that number. So status of incarceration um, is also something that we embrace. Incarcerated people are our people. And so all Black Lives Matter. So again, this is kind of that, um, those kind of two parallel tracks that we talked about. On the left, you see this beautiful drawing of our three co-founders, Patrice Cullors, Opal Tometi, and Alicia Garza. And so they had the intellectual capacity to develop Black Lives Matter as a movement, not a moment, to say that this is time to do something different. On the right, what you see happening is our first planned protest of Black Lives Matter. So we come together on uh, July 15th, 2013 at um, Patrice's community at, at St. Elmo Village. Um, within two days, we conceive of the first planned protest, not just these intuitive protests that we saw in the streets, but ones that we planned. Very early on, and you'll hear me um, talking about this in just a moment, um, we committed to disrupting spaces of white supremacy. And so our first planned march was in Beverly Hills. We met on the corner of La Cienega and Wilshire and marched west down Wilshire to Rodeo um, and took over that rich people's mall on the corner of Wil Wilshire and Rodeo. If you ever saw the movie Pretty Woman, um, this is the Pretty Woman Mall. And what you see, who you see at the top of the steps, who was leading the march, that's my student and my spirit daughter, Sharlia Gully, who's holding the sign. Even though we committed to building a movement, not a moment, the first name that we gave ourselves was Justice for Trayvon Martin, Los Angeles. But you see very small at the top of the sign, the words Black Lives Matter. And Sharlia is at the top of the steps and then at the bottom you see all of the rest of us trying to catch up with Charlia because Charlie is a track star. So I'm pulling from the guiding principles because some people say, well, what is Black Lives Matter? I just wanna uplift three of our 19 principles. One is that all Black Lives Matter, which I've talked about. Two is that we reject respectability politics. And you see that in this moment as mainstream media tries to shift its lens and say, you know, what are these protests about, right? And talk about, you know, um, well, you know, maybe there's questions about whether or not the protesters broke out Starbucks window or whether or not they are taking things that they didn't pay for. Well, we have to remember why we're in the streets in the first place. We are in the streets for black life. We are defending black life. And people and property should never be put in the same category. Beyond that is guiding principle number two, that black people don't just have a right to our sorrow, don't just have a right to our grief, but we have a right to our rage. 
And so it's unfathomable that they could be expecting black people, black nieces and nephews. If you watch the funeral services for George Floyd, um, his niece was very clear that these protests have to continue. And these protests, there's a lot of cussing at them. There's a lot of beauty at them. There's a lot of yelling at them, but they reject respectability politics. We're not developing a movement where we're praying for or asking for our freedom. We're a part of a movement where we demand our freedom, right? Freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed, right? We have to remember those words of Dr. King who they try to cast in the sanitized view, right? Um, and so it's really important that we reject respectability politics. Finally, the third guiding principle that I just wanna to point to for the sake of time is that we enter the movement as our whole selves. So we have to think about the duration of Black Lives Matter so far. And we are absolutely continuing to grow. We are exploding in numbers and resources and really stepping into the second wave of existence. The way that that's happened, the way that Black women have occupied the center, the way that Black, queer, and trans folks have taken up stage. Um, the way that we've been able to do that is that we enter the movement as our whole and complete selves. Nobody gets to tell me I, get to, I can't come to a meeting with my children. Nobody can tell us that we don't get to um, come to the meetings and grieve. Nobody can tell us that we can't come to the meetings and talk about sexism in our own communities or transphobia or homophobia, right? Um, we enter the movement as our whole and complete selves. And what happens as a result of doing that is we're able to maintain participation. Um, I want to talk about specifically the way in which we organize. And I'm looking at the time and I don't want to talk too long because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for conversation. Um, I have a whole lot of campaigns to also get through. So I'm going to just point out um, two of the points um, around, um, or talk fully about two of the points, right? So what is the point of Black Lives Matter? We want to raise awareness. We want to mobilize the masses. We want to engage in what, in what Mama Ella Baker calls group-centered leadership. We are Black-led and ally-supported, recognizing that people who are most directly impacted have the solutions and should be charting the course for our own freedom. Um, number six, I'm jumping to that we want to vision and build a free and just world, but I want to underline points five and seven. That the way in which we organize is to disrupt white supremacy, and we should really expand that and say white supremacist capitalism. So that march that we had in Beverly Hills is not the only example. We march on centers of white supremacist capitalism as our primary form of protest. So we protested just a couple of days ago in Hollywood where we had more than 100,000 people on Hollywood Boulevard, right? Um, protesting the center of white capitalism and tourism, right? Um, we were at Third and Fairfax near the Grove, making sure we disrupt that space of white supremacist capitalism. Every year, and you'll hear me talk about this more later, we go into these spaces and disrupt this notion that we should be shopping for Christmas. We disrupt those spaces. You won't see Black Lives Matter shutting it down on Crenshaw because Black people on Crenshaw are not the problem. Black people on Crenshaw already know why we're outraged. Black people on Crenshaw get it, right? Um, who we want to disrupt, who we want to bring our pain to is the affluent white folks who think they can find a retreat and get to hide their heads in the sands, in the sands, away from the grief and pain that we constantly experience. And then number seven, what are we doing in black community? We believe in building black communities. So at the same time or the day before we're having this massive protest in Hollywood, on Saturday, we have two Build Black Community events. One, we have an event in the park for our young people. Our banner was stolen from one of our um, protests. 
And so we said, let's have an arts day where we make new banners. And we have some organizer artist friends who came in. We played music in the park. We brought food in and it was a healing space for black people. That night, we gathered about 200 black folks in the church basement and talked about what it means to defund the police. So that is what we call building black community. I just wanna quickly go through um, many of the campaigns that we have as Black Lives Matter. Many of you know that we say their names and you see this is kind of a picture that I was trying to get the drone video, but it was difficult for me to drop it in of the 100,000 folks who were gathered on the streets of Hollywood Boulevard. Um, so that's at the center, but we need to remember that underneath that is the names, are the names of not just George Floyd, but of so many others. And so Say Their Names actually began with Say Her Name, because there was this narrative around Black men being killed by police. We have to remember that Black women are also killed by police. And so Charlena Lyles is who you see at the upper right hand corner, who was a mother of five, pregnant mother of five, when she was killed by Seattle police. Waukesha Wilson, whose name I invoked before, was killed inside LA Metro Detention Center um, by LAPD. Um, and her killers have been fired, but not prosecuted. And then as we're lifting up George Floyd, we need to remember that just before his murder was a murder of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, who was asleep at her house in her bed when police came in with a no-knock warrant and murdered her as she slept, then attempted to blame it on her partner. Um, so we want to say their names. We want to say her name, say these women's names. And there are many, many others we could call here, right here in Los Angeles. Um, and I want to point to that as well. You see in the bottom left-hand corner is Philando Castile, who was killed right outside of Minneapolis, just pointing to the wisdom of uh, Minneapolis City Council, who says that they're not just reforming police, but they're disbanding the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, and so we need to uplift these national stories, but we can't do that and neglect what happened to Quentin Thomas. We can't do that and neglect that a 60-year-old Black man was killed last night in Lancaster by LA County Sheriff's Department. We can't be uplifting these national names and um, just completely overlook the fact that LA County is the most murderous municipality in the nation. And so as we call their names, we wanna make sure that you know who Kenneth Ross is, who Christopher DeAndre Mitchell is, who Keisha Michael is, who Riddell Jones is. This really was the first really huge um, effort that we um, engaged in as Black Lives Matter for someone who was murdered by police locally. This was the murder of Ezell Ford, who was um, killed just a day, a few days before um, Michael Brown was killed, two days before Michael Brown was killed. He was killed August 9th, 2014. And um, uh, Mike Brown in Ferguson was killed August 11th. And so it's important that we remember that we have to stand up for our people. And so we were trying to get the release um, of the autopsy report for months. When it was finally released, it confirmed what the community had said about Ezell Ford, that Ezell Ford was murdered face down in the streets and police officers, Charlton Wampler and Antonio Viegas, Wampler who had lots of complaints against him already, shot Ezell Ford in the back at point blank range. So we demanded the immediate arrest, firing, and prosecution of these two officers. We occupied the front of LAPD headquarters for 18 days. It was the coldest winter ever in Los Angeles, and we made that demand. We continued with that demand um, until the Los Angeles Police Commission 
was set to hear um, that call. And that happened in June, 2015. So we moved our protest to the front steps of um, Eric Garcetti and called on him to pr pressure his commissioners to issue that right ruling. So we set up camp in front of his door for three days. He wouldn't come out and meet with us. So you'll, there's kind of infamous video of us catching him leaving out the back door. This is kind of strange feeling like I'm talking to nobody, but I hope you can hear me. Um, we also maintain a presence outside of police commission. Um, so we make sure that we maintain that presence or within police commission meetings. Um, oh, I can see this chat. Great. That's helpful. Then I know, then I know that you're still there. You're here. Yes. Thank you. Um, you're here and listening. That's helpful. One of the things I always say is I'm a black woman and I believe in call and response and using these technologies to mediate um, makes that kind of energy a little difficult. So thank you for dropping that in the chat so that I know that you're here and you're with me and you know, this will be our virtual call and response. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing um, is ever since 2014, we've been attending LA Police Commission meetings. And usually it's a small team of us who go, but recently, with more attention being paid to what's happening in our city um, at the hands of LAPD in particular, um, we've had lots and lots of folks join us at police commission meetings. So this is an old flyer um, highlighting, you know, kind of three of the most problematic figures in Los Angeles. Michael Moore is the police chief. He is literally a killer cop. As a beat cop, he pulled the trigger in two shootings, um, resulting in one death. Um, you have Steve Soboroff, who until very recently was the president of the commission, is now the vice president of the commission. He's a near billionaire land developer who um, often tries to quash protest within the police commission meetings um, and has set up many of us, including myself, for arrest. And then, of course, we have Eric Garcetti, who I mentioned um, refuses to put pressure on his police commission. Um, but also parades around as a progressive um, and likes to point to the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor across the country, but never says the names of the people who were killed by police right here in LA. Um, I'm seeing someone drop in. Where do we go to get info um, to be able to participate? Um, so I was going to drop it in at the end, but let me drop it in the chat here. Um, I'm going to drop our website, and it was also um, on that opening slide, blmla.org, um, has all of our events. Um, and then you can also go to BLM Los Angeles on Instagram, um, BLM Los Angeles on Instagram, and uh, BLMLA on Twitter. Okay, so I hope that you all um, got all of that. Yes, Chelsea, I'm going to get to the budget. You're absolutely right. Garcetti's budget tells where his priorities are. So he parades around as a liberal, um, as a progressive even, but is really not those things. And so um, he can say the name George Floyd, but he cannot say the name, oops, I didn't mean to do that, but I guess it's telling me to hurry up. Um, but he can't say the names of those who were killed right here in this city like Grishario Mack, okay? Um, July 2015, we did a Freedom Ride, which was our first national kind of convening that wasn't just a protest. So in 2014, we went to Ferguson, which is really our first Freedom Ride, right? We went in vans. By 2015, we were smarter than that. If anybody tries to convince you to travel cross country in like five, 15 passenger vans, don't do it. There are no bathrooms on vans, right? So in 2014, we traveled in vans. It took us forever because we had to stop like every hour. We couldn't coordinate the peace schedule. Um, by 2015, we um, were able to get some support to get a charter bus and we all traveled across country. We realized that it was important to make the trip mean something, not just the convening, which was in Cleveland, 
um, in honor of Tamir Rice. Um, it was more than the convening that meant something. So what you see here is actually our last stop on the way back. On the way out, um, we joined up with Denver, BLM Denver. Um, they call themselves BLM 5280 because it's the Mile High City. Um, you all will know that Black Lives Matter Denver was recently successful as of last night in getting Denver public schools to cancel their contracts with police. So there will be no more police in Denver public schools. Um, our first stop on this freedom ride was stopping in Denver and organizing with a, a mass march with BLM Denver. From there, um, we headed on out and I don't even remember where we went. We stopped in Chicago, I think may have been our next stop. We picked up some comrades from Chicago and then went on to Cleveland um, and had a three or four day convening with the movement for Black Lives, Black people all around the country who were committed to doing the work of ending police violence. On the way back, we stopped in St. Louis um, in honor of Mike Brown. We also got word as we were there of the murder of Sandra Bland. Um, and, then find, and then we stopped in Tulsa, Oklahoma um, for Black Wall Street. And as we come up on this Juneteenth, June 19th, we need to remember the power of Black Wall Street. Your um, current occupant of the White House sees fit to actually go to Tulsa, Oklahoma on Ju Juneteenth. So may that invoke the wrath of my ancestors. Um, this picture that you see here was our last stop. We stopped in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we were greeted by our indigenous comrades who opened up space, <clears throat> who fed us and did a cleansing for us, a limpia for us. Um, and what they said in reaching out as they acknowledged that the work that we do is more than justice work, it's also spiritual work. So when we invoke those names, those spirits become present. And some of them are in turmoil. And we have to constantly make sure that our spirits are cleansed. And so this was just a really beautiful gathering between indigenous comrades and black comrades. Um, this is our black worker justice effort, which was uh, again launched in earnest in 2015, but continues even to this day. Um, this was our youth activist camp and it was the birth of our youth vanguard. So in the summer of 2017, I can't believe I didn't put Occupy City Hall, decolonize City Hall. That was the longest black encampment that we know of that wasn't on a campus in US history. So for 54 days in the name of Riddell Jones, we camped outside of City Hall in summer of 2016. By summer of 2017, we realized there's things we have to do for our young people. So we had a youth activist camp, which also kind of helps to solidify our youth vanguard. Our young people moved forward, um, this idea that they have the um, power to organize themselves. Um, and then we also see Black Lives Matter in schools. Some of you are familiar with that. Um, some of you know that they just recently won a victory getting the random searches ended in LA USD schools. Um, we're working on banning pepper spray in schools and removing school police from schools. So we already have several um, unified school districts around the country doing that. Minneapolis was the first. Um, we're getting word that, it's, that Seattle will be next. There is one up in the Bay Area, the first um, California school just canceled their contract. Um, and then last night, of course, Denver Public School. So we want LAUSD to catch up. Some of you know this, that you know, police are always plotting and planning, trying to figure out how to get more power. This was an effort that they made to try to get it so that um, police get to decide whether or not they're up for discipline when they kill or harass or brutalize people. And so we launched a, a really solid campaign against that. This is the fire bet campaign. I wanna lift up that we did win a victory, right? That we have a chance, uh, a chant that we say, um, when we fight, we win, right? So when we fight, we win. Um, and we had been fighting to remove Charlie Beck as police chief for five years. And eventually he said he pledged he was not going to leave his office early um, and we forced him out and so 
The Fire Vet Campaign is another one of our campaigns. This is what I referenced about our Black Xmas campaign, which happens annually. Um, you can go to blackxmas.org and I'll drop that in the chat as well for more information on it. But um, we know that white supremacy and capitalism go hand in hand. There's a message here that Karen Stanford, hey, Dr. Stanford, has dropped a question in here that I'm missing. Let me see if I can read it. Hi, Melina, we appreciate all you do for Black Lives. For those of us who cannot march because of COVID, um, or yeah, because of COVID, um, other than posting on so social media, what other ways can we participate? I am absolutely gonna get to that. So I want you to pay attention to all of these campaigns because these campaigns have both um, in-person presences. So this is the march that we did uh, in December of 2019, where we shut down Hollywood and Highland, um, that shopping center. Um, so we did that work, but there's also work that we did as a part of Black Xmas, which runs from Black Friday to New Year every year, where we're saying we wanted to do three things. Build Black, mean contribute to Black-led organizations. Buy Black, meaning being conscious of our dollars. The Black Xmas campaign came out of the murder of John Crawford, who was murdered inside of a Walmart store. And we know that Walmart is complicit in the murders, in the police murders of our people, just like right here in Los Angeles, 24-hour fitness is complicit in murder because they called police on Dennis Todd Rogers, one of their own members, in 2017 and got him killed for uh, ogling a woman. That's a word I haven't heard since Emmett Till, right? Ogling a woman, um, looking at her, right? Which is what I think most people do at gyms. I don't go to the gym, so I don't really know. Um, but that was 2017. What they do again in 2018 is call the police again on Albert Ramon Dorsey, who um, you can just pull up the video. He was naked and exiting the shower when police killed him. And so we're saying that we want to be conscious about how we use our dollars. So what Dr. Stanford is asking is, um, you know, how do we do that? What are things that we can do beyond marching? Be conscious of how you use your dollars. Don't spend when you don't have to spend. You can use your dollars to build black community. If you go to blackxmas.org and click on build black, there's an entire list of black led organizations um, that you can contribute to. Um, two is buy black. You know, don't spend it or at, at companies like Walmart. Don't buy a gym membership at 24 hour fitness. There are black owned gyms that you can go to. Um, and then finally, we say bank black. Don't give your money to Citibank. They help to finance the Dakota Access Pipeline. Don't give your money to Wells Fargo. They're invested in private prisons. Put your money in credit unions or put your money in, we have the largest black owned bank in the country right here in Los Angeles, One United Bank, which contributes regularly to the Trayvon Martin Foundation, um, which contributes regularly to Black Lives Matter. So those are the three things we say under Black Xmas build black, buy black, bank black. In a second, I'm gonna give you more things that you can do if you can't march. This is our prosecute killer cops, Jackie Lacey must go effort. We've been fighting against district attorney, Jackie Lacey for more than two and a half years now of consistent protest every single Wednesday outside of her office. Our crowd has now grown to be about 5,000 people every Wednesday. We encourage you to join us. Um, if you can't join us, this is something that you can do from home. Since Dr. Stanford asked, please go on our Instagram where we live stream these protests. And more than going on our Instagram, Jackie Lacey is up for re-election um, in November. November 3rd is not just election day for you to vote out the fool who occupies the White House, but it's also election day for local elections which really may have an even Im bigger immediate impact on your life. Jackie Lacey refuses to prosecute the police who kill our people, 
but she over prosecutes black, brown, and poor people. Jackie Lacey has sent exclusively people of color to death row, even though there's supposed to be a moratorium on the death penalty. Jackie Lacey was one of the last district attorneys to expunge the records of those who were um, prosecuted unjustly for marijuana co convictions. So we have to vote her out. She is backed by the Police Protective League, which disguises itself as a union. It is not, it is a police association. And the reason I say it's not is because their interests conflict with the interests of every other working class person, right? So if you can't come out to the protest, we need you to, here's a daily exercise. Say Jackie Lacey must go, text that to five of your own contacts who live in LA County. Because we can't match the funding that she gets from police and sheriff. But we have five months now to really um, engage with our friends so that everybody knows why she has to go. If someone wants to ask me about protests at her doorstep and um, how her husband pulled a loaded weapon on me, pointed it at my chest and said, I will shoot you. I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A. Um, so that's another ongoing campaign. Black LA Demands, I forgot to drop in the graphic, but if you go to tinyurl.com slash Black LA Demands, and I'll put that in the chat as well, you will see that we have been engaged in a process of um, trying to make sure that in the midst of this pandemic that we get um, resources for the people who are most directly affected. Um, and so we released these Black LA demands in concert with virtually every single Black community um, leader in the county. Okay, I'm seeing lots of questions. Um, what do I think of Gascon? I think Lacey is terrible. Um, and I'll say it that way because you know anybody who's a district attorney um, is not really um, gonna be as on our side, although I'm very encouraged by Chesa Boudin in San Francisco who has made it his duty, who has made it his call to decarcerate, right? You never hear district attorneys talking about that. So yes, George Gascon is, the opponent of Jackie Lacey. Um, he has been out and met with the families of those who've been killed. Um, and so we're not going to, um, we're not going to uh, endorse him, but we do know he's been more accessible. Okay, we also engage in the work of political education, right? So a lot of this conversation is super important. And I see the chat asking about defunding the police, which I will absolutely get to in the next five minutes. And in five minutes, I promise I'll shut up and engage in the chat um, more fully. Um, so we believe it's important to not just be in the streets, but do what Kwame Ture says, which is study and organize, study and work study and protest. So every Thursday night, we hold virtual town halls around concepts, right? So this is about the power of protest. And we had our co-founder, Patrice Cullors on. She's also the author, author of When They Call You a Terrorist, um, actor, activist, and my little brother from another mother, Kendrick Sampson, who's been helping to um, organize many of the protests, especially since the murder of George Floyd. He was on and then Joseph Williams, who's really leading the work along with the young people in the schools, um, as well as being on the front lines, was on. So we kind of talked about why we're in the streets. Last night, we talked about what it means to defund the police and the relationship between calls to defund the police and uh, uh, calls for police abolition. So we believe in political education. Here's the question. People's budget. You all know that the Black LA demands really led to this convening of what we call the people's budget. So Black Lives Matter absolutely called for a people's budget. We began challenging, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, challenging Mayor Garcetti's budget proposal 
which spends 54%, which proposes spending 54% of the city's general fund on LAPD. We say no way. That should not be what we spend our money on. That does not create safe communities. Safe communities are created when you invest in universal human needs like housing, like healthcare, like quality after school programs, like mental health resources, like libraries and parks, right? These are the things that lead to safe communities. And so as we began to blast that out, really pointing to um, the outrage of it all, and we had been doing this for the last five years, really underscoring how unjust his budget was and calling for a participatory budgeting, calling for a people's voice. Um, as we began doing that, we also heard from a lot of our friends because in the midst of this pandemic, when we need money for healthcare, when we need money, uh-oh, am I talking too much? I heard a beep. No, okay. When we need money for economic, the economic, to address the economic fallout, um, to spend 54% on the budget of the budget um, of the unrestricted funds um, is really terrible. Thank you for posting that, Madison. Yes, you can go to our Facebook page and watch these town halls. Um, good. Okay, so I'm still on. Okay, so thank you, Freddie. Um, so we began these calls to defund the police, especially this year, um, because also as we're having a need for healthcare resources for, um, you know, to meet the economic needs of people who are losing their jobs, we're also seeing a drastic drop in crime. So why would you need more police? And what we heard is a terrible answer. They said they have police doing jobs of social workers, of drug rehabilitation counselors, of EMTs. We say they have no business or expertise in doing those jobs. When you defund the police, you can hire real social workers. When you defund the police, you can hire real drug rehab counselors. When you defund the police, you can hire real EMTs and real park workers and youth workers and interventionists, and it's much more effective. So that's where defund the police comes from. Um, it's part of a people's budget effort. Um, and I'm getting to the end of the presentation. I just want to point out some of the organizations that we work with. I want to say some of the things that you can do. Um, so absolutely, I say that you have three things that we need from you in this movement. We need your voice, your body, and your resources. We need for you to amplify what it is we're saying. So we've been having these Twitter storms. We were able to get People's Budget LA on Monday, trended number one in the entire United States for three hours, right? Defund the police has become the rallying cry globally. That comes out of our work. We need you to lift that up. And when your mother or grandmother or your neighbor says, why do you say defund the police? Or why are some people saying that, you know, we need police abolition? We need you to be ambassadors and help to translate that. That when we say we don't need police in our schools, it doesn't mean that we don't have safety. It doesn't mean that we, that we don't have a community safety plan, right? What we're saying is that in my view and in Black Lives Matter view, Matters view, schools should be a place of complete abolition of police. And that's something that we had in my generation, right? There were not police in schools, right? That's your parents' generation, or actually a little younger than your parents, probably, right? Um, we didn't have police in schools. What creates safe schools is what we did have. We had nurses in schools, we had librarians in schools, we had counselors in schools. And they were there every day, not once a week. And so we need you to translate that for us. We need you to talk with the people you know about why it's important to defund the police, why you can't simply chant George Floyd's name without also saying the system of policing that we live under has to be dismantled and something new built. We need your body. We need you to show up and support us at Actions. Um, but also at planning sessions. So again, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. 
So again, <clears throat> every Wednesday, I promise it's not coronavirus. It's just that I need to drink more water and I'm talking too much. Um, um, every Wednesday, we need you to show up at those protests. If you can, if you can, if you're immunocompromised, if you have other concerns, then join us on IG Live. We also need your body, though, at more than the protests. We do most of our work behind the scenes. So come to our planning meetings. Every month, we have a planning meeting. We have our general meetings. It's this Sunday at McCarty Memorial Church. All are welcome, and we feed you. And then finally, we need your resources. We need your gifts, skills, and resources. And I know y'all broke college students, but if you have some money, please give it to us. Um, so that is, I believe, what I have for you. I was gonna show you a video, um, but I think we should just move into conversation. So I don't know if it's set up um, for us to have a conversation. If other people are on this, can come on the screen. Um, it's a webinar, so maybe not. But if we can, I would love for that to happen so that we can hear other vo voices. I need host option. Let's see, if we can bring other people on the screen, that would be great. Right now, I'll engage in the chat, though. So I'm looking at some of these questions. Um, why are cops kneeling to support Black Lives? Does, doesn't help at all. Can we talk about it? Yes, absolutely. We don't need your symbolism. We don't need you kneeling. We need you to go away, basically. And so I am, I'm going to give you full transparency. I am an abolitionist, right? I think also, though, that it's um, extremely insensitive for police to take up space in a place where they have traumatized people. And so we are not trying to hug police. We're not trying to kneel with them. We're not trying to meet with them even. We're trying to say that we want them defunded and we need resources for our community. Another question, Dr. Abdullah, great to hear from you. Oh, that's Dr. Webb. Hey, Dr. Webb. What methods do you have to ensure that your message is not co-opted or distorted? Um, well, you know, if we, Think about the way in which a uh, chorus of voices can't be undermined. We need everybody to be saying these things. We need everybody to say defund the police. We need everybody to talk about what transformation means. We need everybody to start with saying at least abolish police in schools. Is defund the police the same as abolish the police? I, I believe I've addressed it, but if you want to pull up last night's conversation that was the question of the hour it's not the same thing but it exists along the same continuum right so on the continuum of defund the police um, there's what your mayor was forced to do right remove 150 million dollars in spending and invested in communities right let's be very clear he didn't do this of his own volition he was forced into it because we showed up at his doorstep 5,000 folks strong last Tuesday, right? And on the day he made that announcement, we were about, there were tens of thousands of us outside of City Hall. Um, that $150 million still leaves $3 billion in the LAPD budget. So that's way to the minimal side of defunding the police. Abolishing the police is of course the complete form of defunding the police. We want to move us as far towards that end as possible, recognizing that it won't always happen immediately. What happened in Minneapolis should be inspirational for us, the fact that they are disbanding the police. Um, but we can also look to cities like Newark, New Jersey, where the mayor there, Raz Baraka, is shifting money away from police, not all of it, but a lot of it, and enacting and um, creating these community care teams, which you know don't come into communities with badges and guns. They're people who live in the community and they can speak to the needs for resources for the community and sometimes intervene when there's you know, possibilities of eruptions within the communities. That's been much more effective than 
um, launching police into communities with badges and guns. Um, can't we change the wording? Defund the police will speak to people as take away all their money and I fear will lead to increase in gun sales. How about reallocate police resources and retrain? Um, so no, Amy. Um, the call is to defund the police. We absolutely want to take away all their resources. Um, and so we're very clear about what that means. And we're encouraging people to recognize that reforming police has been a call for decades and generations, and it hasn't worked. We're just straight up fed up. We don't want policing in its current form. I mean, think about how ridiculous it would be for people to say, let's just reform chattel slavery, let's not abolish it. Well, policing is a vestige of chattel slavery. And, you know, don't believe me, you can ask Dr. Stanford or you can read works by people like Ruth Wilson Gilmore, or you can read works by people like Khalil Gibran Muhammad out of Harvard, um, who affirm that policing as we know it evolves out of slave catching. Um, and so we can't reform that. We have to abolish it and build new systems, reimagine what community safety means. Um, is the gathering at McCarty Memorial Church on Sunday or Monday? Oops, is that wrong? Do I have the wrong date? Um, it is Sunday. So is Sunday the 14th and not the 15th? It's Sunday. So yes, you're right. It's the 14th. It was me moving too fast. So it is Sunday the 14th. Thank you for seeing that Elba. Is there a place on the website that lists current initi initiatives, plans, proposed policies, and changes? Yes, you can go to our current campaigns. Speaking of broke, if anybody is an independent contractor and needs help getting their unemployment, that's Tracy saying that she can help. Um, is the screen black on purpose? You know what? I need to stop screen share. Thank you, I'm sorry it took me so long to see this. Um, no, I don't, stop share. Okay, let me stop the share. And then you can see everything, I think. Hi, good, okay. So we see our interpreter on the screen. Thank you for alerting me to that. Um, okay, is there anything else in the chat that we need to get through? Dr. Abdullah, there is a question here. Um, what are thoughts for staff and faculty to help campuses support and disrupt sy uh, systemic racism? And the person is really highlighting staff because due to lots of contract issues, they feel like they have limited protections uh, versus faculty. So I think we absolutely have to organize ourselves, right? So we have a Black fa Faculty and Staff Association Black Faculty and Staff Caucus at Cal State LA. I hope you have one at Northridge. Um, you should be meeting regularly, either in person or virtually. Um, but I think that there's lots of calls. One, you need to look at the rates um, at which call for a state of emergency um, in your, on your campus and throughout the CSU. Um, we are failing Black students. Black students constitute only 3% of our student body in the CSU. Um, and even less than that at Cal State LA, we're down to almost 2%. Um, CSUN is slightly better, but it's not great either. So it's nothing to brag about. Right. We're calling for the state of emergency, but we also know black students do well when there are strong black studies, Africana studies programs. Um, Building strong ethnic studies programs means making ethnic studies a requirement. And so back to AB 1460, we absolutely need that to pass. That's something black students, faculty and staff can all work on and should be seeing as a charge. And then as we talk about police violence, when we say there are places for abolition and I believe it starts with schools, I wanna include us as schools, right? Think about the trauma that must be experienced um, on your campus um, as friends and loved ones of Quentin Thomas see officers walking around with guns. Why can't the Cal States also be a place of abolition? Um, and so the University of Wisconsin 
canceled their contracts with police. There will be no armed police on any of their campuses. Cal State should follow suit and there shouldn't be any police. And if you can't get this, uh, the entire campus to go forward with it, you, um, and as you know, cross-cultural centers, as student centers, as departments, in the Department of Pan-African Studies, we fought with our administration and said, there will be no campus police at any of our events. And they pushed back on us and said, no, because you know, I also get a lot of death threats. I don't feel safer with police. You know, police got a gun, got a target on my back. So we actually contract with organizations like the Brown Berets. We contract with organizations like FOI to come in and provide our security. Um, and we bar police from any of our events. So those are things that you can do. I also wanna lift up that there are protests happening on campus, I believe today. Um, Justin Marks, who's one of your students in Africana Studies and also a very active member of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles is leading the work on your campus. So please come out, my phone is acting up, but as soon as his, oh, here we go. Um, so today, oh, that's tomorrow. Let me see. There's one today though. Um, that is at City Hall. The one today, the one tomorrow is Northridge. Okay, so Saturday, June 13th at 10 a.m. Come out to the Northridge Mall entrance between Tampa and Shirley. That's tomorrow. Come out to the Northridge Mall en entrance. Um, the hashtags are defund the police, care not cops, People's Budget LA, Black Lives Matter will be there and Justin is leading. So um, those are things that you can do. Perfect, thank you. There's also another question and you kind of hit on it in some of the things, your last response. And it says, as a CSUN professor, can you discuss how students, staff and administrators can really translate that work on campus. Um, and it has an example that a former faculty senate president and campus president regularly relied on policing of student and faculty protesters. Uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is a moment. And so those of us who um, have studied history know that we haven't seen a moment like this. This is not just a crack. This is the gaping um, thoroughfare in the existing system, right? We have a moment to run through it right now. 